Hello everyone, welcome to today's video, uh, it's the highly requested, so we're going to go back over the 9.2 Destruction Warlock Guide, we're going to update it, revise it, and above all else, we're actually going to just flat eliminate the music, um, because that's a criticism you guys have had. So without any further delay, let's get into the video. Starting with the Covenants then, as per previously. Destruction is in a really good spot in that all covenants are viable based on the content you want to do. So you've got Night Fae, Venthyr, Necrolord, Kyrian, and all of them are viable. You'll see on screen that the ones highlighted are kind of the ones I'm going to discuss with them being the main picks. There obviously are cases to be made, especially for Night Fae and Venthyr, but we'll get into those specifically because you can play around with either Karain or Nadia respectively. But let's get into it in detail. So let's start with Night Fae then. Starting with Night Fae then, because this is considered your bread and butter covenant and the one you will be using in the majority of content. Dreamweaver is your soulbind of choice for, again, about 99% of the content you'll be running because of the way you line up with Destruction. We'll be discussing stats later in the video, but Dreamweaver gives 15% haste through Field of Blossoms, which is a trade where when you cast Soul Rot, you put an AoE effect on the ground, you stand in it, you get that haste. So... It's a lot stronger if you can stand still and you're aware of the fight. It's further amplified when you consider the legendary Decaying Soul Satchel paired with the ability itself. Now, the ability doesn't synergize as well as it does for Affliction, um, and I discussed that in other videos, but the strength comes with Decaying Soul Satchel, so each target afflicted by Soul Rod increases your haste and crit by 5% for 8 seconds stacking. So you can get 15-20% haste and crit for free in AoE settings. Pair that with Dreamweaver's additional haste and you can see this kind of snowballing. The exception to this where you may want to run Karain instead is when you can make use of Karain's ability to hit targets early uh, before they hit you in order to get the crit. So you'll see it used on certain raid fights like Anduin during the ad phase when you have a lot of ads spawn you can get that free crit amp very very quickly very early on and because so many ads are spawning you can kind of keep that going during your cooldown windows. But generally speaking you'll be looking to Dreamweaver for Night Fae. Now moving on to Necrolord. Now going from the most used Covenant in Night Fae, we're going to go to the most niche in Necrolord. And this is because Necrolord specializes in pure single target. It's losing out in cleave situations to Kyrian, but we'll discuss that in its own section. Now, Necrolord's strength lies purely in its ability to do single target damage, but execute single target damage at that. So if you're having prolonged 30% or less phases for boss fights then necrolord might be somewhere you want to look to and for that reason marileth becomes the strongest because of kevin's oozling which is marileth's final trait at the bottom where when you cast decimating bolt you then apply a damage debuff to the target so that it takes six percent more damage from you now pair that with decimating bolts increasing effect on your incinerate damage based on the target's missing health, so the less health they have, the more damage it does, and then Shard of Annihilation compounding that further with its additional crit and crit damage, it means that your Incinerate during Execute Windows are going to be hitting harder than some of your Chaos Bolts, and that's just the natural order of things, of, unfortunately. So you can get three very, very powerful Incinerates out, every 45 seconds that just progressively hit harder and harder and harder. So that is Necrolord's niche. And on that same vein, let's go into Venthyr. On the vein of niches, Venthyr is more your tank utility with damage element, primarily in things like Mythic Plus. The reason for this is Impending Catastrophe smart applies your Curse of Tongues or Curse of Weakness to targets based on whether they're casters or melee adds, respectively. And 
especially in higher keys, this can be a real godsend for your tanks. Or if your group is lacking in kicks, using Curse of Tongues is really helpful. I do have a video that will be slightly off topic about Curse of Tongues in down the road. I just need permission with a collaborator to use some of their footage. But in doing so and being able to use your curses appropriately, you could make the difference in a group. Not necessarily huge or not something that will always be felt. But it does make a difference. An impending catastrophe in AoE applying these curses saves you globals so you can focus on damage. And at the same time, the legendary contained perpetual explosion. Impending catastrophe's damage is increased by 125% plus 15% for every target hit on its way to its final target, capping out at a maximum of 275%. Now, in English, and what that essentially means is impending catastrophes damage increases as it passes through targets to get to its final mark so a little bit of positioning is required here to get the most out of it but generally speaking if you imagine you have your tank on one spot you somewhere else and all the mobs in the middle just hit the one that's closest to the tank and have everything go through if you can and if you can't, don't worry, just fire it off at a target that's kind of in the middle of the clump. And you will do a huge amount of damage. Uh, and by huge amount of damage, I mean it will be your second or third most damaging ability over the course of a dungeon if you use it right, especially in something like Halls of Atonement. And because of this, a good soulbind to use is Theatar. And this is because Theotar gives Mastery Amp if you stand in it, and also gives you extra stats if you use his T. There is a little bit of debate at the bottom of the Soul Band whether you go left or right. I go right to pick up the extra Endurance Conduit and the extra Avoidance and things by being feasted, which helps, but you can also go left and standing in the shade provided by the first trait, the Umbrella, which is also a Mastery Increase, gives you a damage reduction. And an interesting note for newer Warlocks that are new to the scene, Mastery acts as both a damage increase and a damage reduction for Destruction Warlocks. You have an RNG chance to lower the damage you take by essentially double what the baseline stat is. So if it says you have a damage reduction of 10% through your Mastery, you then have another random chance to reduce it further by up to an additional 10%. It could be that 1% or it could be that maximum 10%. It's why you see so much damage fluctuation in things like your Chaos Bolts. You might have one Chaos Bolt that quote-unquote crits for 18k, and then you might have another one that crits for 30. And this is because our mastery has quite an effect on our damage. It's one of the reasons why when we go into stats, you don't actually want that much mastery. But Theatar is able to assist in helping reduce damage or increasing it in the vein of reducing mastery though this is where you can play with nadia because nadia does give thrill of the hunt or thrill seeker sorry and she then increases your stats respectively the only problem with nadia is it can the stat proc can proc at the wrong times whereas theatars is pretty much always guaranteed to proc in the middle of something rather than right at the end as things are dying and you're trying to have to chase into the next pack. It's not too bad if you have an aggressive tank, but it is something to think of going forward. Another additional perk for Theatar is the additional movements that you can get in having two Door of Shadows rather than one, and it just kind of helps smooth out getting around places. It's not as good as Soul Shape, but something to consider. Now, Onto the Dark Horse, and the one that I've recently been scrambling to get sorted. So, finally onto Kyrian then. Kyrian has gained its strength in cleave situations where one target is dying considerably faster than the other. Notable raid fights being Vigilant Guardian, The Sorge, and Rigalon. And this is because of Scouring Tide's interaction with Languishing Soul Detritus. Now we have access to two legendaries. Now, Scouring Tithers' ability itself is an arcane 
dot, essentially, that lasts 18 seconds. It has some initial damage, and if the enemy dies while afflicted by it, it generates five soul shards, but if it expires, its cooldown is refreshed. So you can keep it indefinitely up on bosses. Now, the strength of this comes when you pair it with the legendary Languishing Soul Detritus, which, when, it, when Scouring Tide generates shards, will give you 100% movement speed and 45% crit, but if it expires naturally, which allows you to then reapply it, you're then going to have 33% increased movement speed and 15% additional crit for 8 seconds. Now, the strength of this is where you can get both frequently. And we'll discuss this more in particular when I get to kind of like the rotation and Havoc windows, and I'll probably release the Havoc video as its own segment as well. Because Kyrian becomes very, very strong when you can maximize this. So it's very much a min-max covenant. So not necessarily for the faint of heart, but if you can get used to it, it becomes incredibly strong and will surpass night fairy in these settings so like vigilant guardian really really good example if you can learn to min max kyrian by utilizing havoc by putting havoc onto vigilant guardian itself and then making it add your priority kill target you will get a huge amount of extra damage over the course of the fight whereas something like night fairy with all the ads present, you just soul rot, you'd get your 20% haste and crit, you'd get your Dreamweaver buff, and then you just continue going to town. A languishing Soul Detritus is much stronger in that setting, despite it initially sounding like it would actually be a detriment because it's not as AoE focused. The Sorge is a perfect uh, use of it in a single target setting. You have one ad that spawns roughly every 30 40 seconds and that is going to die very very quickly or should die very very quickly and then you can go back to funneling a target ragalon same same thing and in mythic plus it's becoming to become the mainstay as well so highlighting mechanicos then as our covenant of choice you actually have two variants depending on what you're doing you'll see that after the first Endurance Conduit, you have a choice to go straight down to Hammer of Genesis, picking up a second Endurance Conduit, or you can go down to get your second Potency, get Soul Clamps, um, which as a trait itself isn't particularly good, it just reduces the CC duration of something on you if you stood still for a while. Um, I've not really seen much use of it, but you pick up that Potency, which is why the Covenant Potency is there, and I'll discuss the Conduits in a moment. But if you're having a fight like the Sorge, where you are going to be casting a lot of single target spells, then it is likely that you're going to want to pick this up. Whereas Hammer of Genesis, where when you attack a new target, you get 3% haste stacking up to 15%, you're going to see this more in Mythic Plus settings or high AoE, so Vigilant Guardian and you might want to swap between these variants having a conduit set up like this will mean that you have all the conduits in place so with a tome you can just swap back and forwards especially on a raid setting so having discussed this let's actually get into the conduits then and kind of talk things through as my insight's a little bit different to guides like wowhead right Conduits, and I appreciate that what you're looking at now is just a wall of text. So I'll try to break this down for you. Across the very top, you have your Covenant Portency Conduits, Soul Eater, Fatal Decimation, Soul Tithe, and Catastrophic Origin. On the far left, you then have underneath the potencies Ashen Remains and Infernal Brand, both potencies. Those are your two almost permanent go-tos. You will always have Infernal Brand slotted. And in almost all situations, you will have Ashen Remains. The only time you might not have this is if you're ha playing a dedicated Havoc fight, uh, something like Prototype Pantheon or large AoE fights where you want to replicate your Havoc damage or increase your Havoc damage instead. Um, 
it's very, very niche. Generally, you'll just see Ashen Remains kept in because you'll still be Chaos Bolting, but having a little bit more damage transferred over and things like you can flag your rates and stuff like that is sometimes required or useful. The Endurance Conduits are placed in order in the center column. Diabolical Bloodstone, Condensed Animosphere, and then Resolute Barrier. Resolute Barrier was slotted in if you're playing something like Mechanicos, where you're in three Endurance Conduits because you've gone for Hammer of Genesis, at which point Resolute Barrier just reduces the cooldown of an unending resolve when you're taking damage. So it's not huge in a PvE setting. It sees more use in PvP. But if you're doing like a really, really high key and you're taking a lot of damage, then Resolute Barrier is actually pretty good. But Diabolic Bloodstone and Condensed Atmosphere are kind of your go-tos first and foremost. And then for Finesse Conduit, generally speaking, you're only going to have the one Finesse Conduit. So you're going to run Di uh, Demonic Momentum, which uh, increases your movement speed after you cast Demonic Circle Teleport for five seconds. This is really good for... Uh, additional movement so if you put like demonic circle in the center of a fight space you can then teleport to it and then it helps you get further away good good examples of preparation for this are things like skolex livum uh disorge as well disorge is a really good example of this because you can skip rings and then reposition into a better place always handy Failing that though, if you do have a second finesse conduit, having something like Fel Celerity is also a really good conduit to use because Fel Celerity reduces the cooldown on Fel Domination, and you'll see more use of this in like Mythic Plus if for whatever reason your pet gets smacked and dies. Because having a shorter cooldown on being able to instant summon your pet, although niche helps because it gives us that extra utility because remember i think our pets have magic dispels and an interrupt on our fell hunter we have a magic dispel on our imp which is really really strong for fights like call the rock in theater of pain especially on tyrannical weeks so fell celerity is a good secondary finesse conduit to have the fear one is really only for pvp because you very rarely fear mobs in a pve setting because uh, you don't want it to run into other packs and socially aggro. So that kind of covers the conduits. I appreciate it is a wall of text, but hopefully I've managed to make some sense of the mess for you guys. So on to the next segment at long last. Now we've discussed covenants. Right, on to the talent section then. And before we go any further, I need to preface this and say that the majority of this guide is focused around having tier set preferably for set because that's where destruction does best however i appreciate some people don't like playing other warlock specs and just specifically want to play destruction so from a raiding perspective at least while you guys are doing your single target and stuff on screen is the flashover roaring blaze single target build that is pre-set and in doing so, you also see a potency conduit up on screen as well. This will take over from having your covenant potencies. So your scouring tithe, your soul rots, and things like that. And the reason for that is because what you're doing, and we'll discuss this as well in the legendary section, but you're focusing around increasing the amount of fire damage you do, specifically things like immolate. So roaring blaze, when you conflagrate, increases the damage of your immolate or rather increases your fire damage that you do to the target, and then Combusting Engine increases the damage that your Immolate does by 16% until Immolate expires or is refreshed. So you have this play style of applying your Immolate, conflagurating multiple times, buffing your Incinerate damage, and this build, if you're going to be playing it, will play very, very well with Necrolord and is also kind of borderline PvP. So something to keep in mind, but with the honourable mention for those that want to play without tier, here you go. But let's get on to assuming you have the four set. So onto the talent for if you have your four set, you'll see both single target and mythic slash AOE up on screen. You'll see that the only variation is moving from Cataclysm across to Inferno. So let's discuss 
the rest of the talents. So when you have your four set and the ability to spawn free infernals, your blasphemy infernals, you're going to start seeing an increased amount of shard generation through the blasphemy infernal aura and also how it kind of pairs with reign of chaos but we'll discuss that when we get to it but as a result you end up with a lot more shards you're passively generating more shards this means that we have a much higher uptime of eradication now eradication once you chaos bolt a target increases all the damage we deal to that target for a short period of time about six seconds which means that we chaos bolt and then we're going to start doing more damage with our emulator can flags incinerates rain of fires the lot and that helps especially in a raiding setting now in a mythic plus slash aoe setting we're still going to be chaos bolting from time to time but we may see a lot more rain of fires from pack to pack but at that point the first tier becomes kind of irrelevant because you're not really going to make full use of flashover and soul fire unfortunately is a non-pick Going to the second row, Reverse Entropy is still really, really good. The ability to proc an extra amount of haste for free is just too good to pass up. The honorable mention would be Shadowburn, and Shadowburn makes its home when you're running things like Mythic Plus for Explosive Weeks, or if you're just running low Mythic Plus. Like, if you really overgear something as a Destruction Warlock, we run into this problem where our damage is neutered quite drastically because things are dying too quickly. It's something that elemental shamans suffer with as well, where we kind of, we don't have the same AOE burst that something like a fire mage does, where they can get everything out in eight seconds and Bob's your uncle. We actually need mobs to live in order for our back end DPS to ramp. Uh, think Affliction Warlock on steroids. You need to get your damage out, you need to get it rolling, and then once it's rolling, it becomes this boulder that's going downhill that'll just flatten everything. And it's when you start getting into like 20, 30 second pack pulls where things are still alive and stuff, where you start seeing the famous 400k DPS situations that Destruction Warlocks can pull. It's because they're cheesing a 20 second pull into then an immediate pull of something new with eight infernals out or whatever so shadowburn makes its name in situations like that when things are going to be dying quickly you, you can generate your free shards and you can kind of spiral the 30 row and 40 row specifically are kind of personal choice for a lot of it generally speaking though the 40 choice will stay mortal coil but the 30 row you can swap between demon skin burning rush and dark pact depending partially on what covenant you're playing um if you're playing a slightly less mobile covenant whether it be kyrian or necrolord you could have burning rush because burning rush gives you that mobility that you lose out by being either kyrian or necrolord whereas either of those two give you a pseudo defensive either in the form of fleshcraft or in the form of the Kyrian Vile, because remember, we do get that heal. It's not if it, it's not the same, or the same strength as something like Dark Pact, but it is there, so you can make that trade-off. Now, Dark Pact is a really, really powerful cooldown, and will give you like 600k health shield. Um, not 600k, an extra 60k, sorry. Which can almost in some cases especially when you're pairing it with other defensives or soul leech effectively double your health pool it makes warlocks incredibly tanky and is only on a minute cooldown demon skin on the other hand just empowers our basic soul leech so soul leech is a mechanic for you your warlocks if you don't know is when we do damage a percentage a percentage of that becomes an absorb uh, an extra health bar essentially that caps out now, Demon Skin increases that cap, but also means that it regenerates passively. So, you will start fights with this shield, but it diminishes as a fight goes on because you're taking damage and it doesn't necessarily have time to recover. But if you want to have a more passive option, especially if you're learning Warlock and you're new to the class, then maybe Demon Skin is a good pick for you to start with until you kind of know where your survivability lies, and then you can start playing with Dark Pact.
because Dark Pact it does have a downside in that it does sacrifice a portion of your health, and the amount of health it sacrifices is proportional to the shield you get. So Dark Pact is a lot better if you're at like 80% health and you use it, rather than if you're at 2% health and you use it, because the shield is going to be negligible. Extreme example, but hopefully it illustrates the point of Dark Pact. Now, the 35 row, Cataclysm vs Inferno, and Fire and Brimstone. You'll see that Cataclysm is highlighted for single target because it is still best for single target. It does an incredible amount of damage up front, and it also applies our Immolate for us, so is really handy. Whereas Inferno, Inferno increases the damage of our Reign of Fire, but also gives Reign of Fire the chance to generate Soul Shards. It has recently, or it had previously taken a nerf in that you need more mobs in order to hit this critical mass where you physically can't spend shards fast enough than Inferno can generate them, because you can have multiple Reign of Fires down at any given point. And that hasn't really dampened its effect. Like The nerf hasn't really been noticeable up until a certain point, because you should still be having your immolate up on multiple targets, but we'll get into that nuance once we get to the rotational section. Inferno is still your go-to for Mythic Plus. Now, again, kind of if you're doing low dungeons, or uh, whether it be helping friends, or as I said, you overgear the content, then you might actually want to stay Cataclysm in AoE situations because of that ramp. Inferno is the talent that gives us that AoE ramp that you see in dungeons. We need stuff to live. And if it's not going to, having the burst AoE every 30 sec, uh, 30, 45 seconds that Cataclysm has, plus all the Immolate damage, is far superior than Inferno. You could make a case for Fire and Brimstone and AoE incinerating things, but generally speaking, Cataclysm will outperform it in those low-key settings. Now, the 40 row, as I said, Model Coil is generally going to be your go-to for a lot of a lot of things because it is a heal and nine times out of ten the horrify effect isn't actually going to be um a component of it like you'll use it on bosses for the 20 percent health regen but in rare occasions having an extra form of cc to stop a cast or to move a target that isn't necessarily playing ball with your tanks can be useful and it's on a short enough duration the horrify being only a couple of seconds that it's not likely to socially aggro into another pack unlike fear which is why we don't go for howl of terror because the last thing you want is to be in the middle of a pack have an aoe fear go off and then all of a sudden you've had one mob run and pull something to your left another mob to run behind you and pull the pack that you deliberately tried to skip because it's got a nasty caster in it and you can get the drift Dark Fury is useful in reducing the cooldown of Shadow Fury, but it's not that huge of a reduction. And generally speaking, a lot of classes have stuns now, so you're likely to then run into a situation of having DR. So Model Coil will kind of be your default choice, but it's entirely up to you guys. Moving into the 45 row, you have Reign of Chaos. Now, Reign of Chaos really makes its strength known once you end up in a situation where you have your four set. And this is because whenever you summon an Infernal, or uh, Infernal, or your Blasphemy Infernal, you can then spawn more through Reign of Chaos by spending the shards that you're generating. And this spirals, especially in AoE situations when you have Infernal and you're generating shards from your Reign of Fires. So you're spending and generating simultaneously. And in that same vein, Soul Conduit becomes strong because as you're spending your Soul Shards, the more you spend, the more you're going to actually get back through Soul Conduit. So, they're the strengths of the talents. Now, moving on to the next section. Right, so moving on to the gear then, and deviating from the previous guide where I pulled up both a Dungeon Biss list and a Raid Biss list, we're just going to talk about trinkets because the reality is at this stage with the creation catalyst now existing you're going to want to go for item level and then you're going to want to make sure that you have your four set pieces of gear your tier pieces now 
you're probably going to want to acquire all five so then you can move legendaries around especially if you do plan on multi-specking but if your main focus is destruction then helm will be your last slot that you go to acquire either through the catalyst or through raid drops and the reason for this is because for single target one of the legendaries we use which i'll discuss goes on helm and if you're then going to play around with other legendaries and you're going to have multiple crafts then you might also put unity on helm for an aoe setting to maximize that um extra item level and stats so you're swapping legendary for legendary but we'll discuss that in the legendary section itself so from the gear then the main focus is going to be the trinkets and kind of trinkets you're going to run want to come across and things like that so across the top of the screen you've got your main ones that you're going to see your unbound changeling your first sigil iqd soul letting ruby with soul letting ruby and unbound changeling dropping from theater of pain and mist of tin aside respectively and those are kind of going to be your two minute aoe mythic plus bread and butter trinkets now iqd is a three minute cooldown and this is fantastic if you're playing pure single target or you're not playing with one of the legendaries that we have access to so if you're using madness of the uh, ajakir which we'll discuss shortly and using unity you will have a three minute infernal at which point it lines up very very well with iqd first sigil is also a long cooldown trinket but the problem is it's a five minute cooldown trinket so you're very much going to have to make use of these at key points so whenever you bloodlust if you're playing kyrian for instance it'll be one of those particular moments where you can make full use of languishing soul detritus and you can have that extra 45 percent crit and you can fully capitalize on it because as you can see on screen a 265 item level version gives 1242 versatility for 20 seconds but again it's on a five minute cooldown so i prioritize getting changeling iqd and solitic ruby all of which drop from dungeons and you can get those up to 272 comfortably and they'll see you through the majority of the exp uh majority of the season sorry underneath you have solaria secret technique and elegy of the eternals now these are both passive haste trinkets elegy drops from prototype pantheon as does the first sigil so that's kind of your boss when it comes to trinkets and solaria secret technique drops from the upper wing of taz of Vesh. now solaria secret technique requires you to pursue a person in your group that has the highest stat that you want so if you actually have to create mastery you're going to have to discuss with your group as to who has that highest stat and in doing so you gain 106 of that high stat and they get 17 as a perk at 262 elegy of the eternals on the other hand takes your highest stat and gives you an increased amount of it and then grants 10 percent of that amount to the rest of your group or your party that are also in the same covenant as you so if you've got three or four night face for instance all running elegy of the eternals it's worth putting them in a group together think season one hymnists uh cabal hymn from uh castle Mathria. that kind of group thing it also works for melee or whatever else but this is covenant focused and generally speaking you will see this in place of unbound changeling because you're going to want one passive and one on use generally so that's kind of wrapped up trinket and as i say going back to an actual bis list if you do want to see one please do refer to my other destruction videos because they are still relevant in this i'm just updating everything else and obviously removing the music so on to the next section then on to the legendaries then staying on the vein of gearing you'll see on screen three legendaries now two of them are only relevant when you have tier and those are madness of the ajakir and wilfred sigil of summoning cinders of the ajakir gets its 
spot on this screen purely as a honorable mention for those that are playing destruction without tier set if you remember going back to the talent section there was the roaring blaze segment and the legendary of choice you use while running roaring blaze is the cinders of the ashikir because it gives you an extra conflagrate charge and also reduces its cooldown by three seconds this allows for a much greater uptime of roaring blaze and therefore your fire damage amplification once you do acquire your tier set though single target you will transition to madness of the ashikir which buffs your chaos bolt your chaos bolt increases the damage of further chaos bolts by 25 percent and reduces its cast time as well by 20 seconds think of it as backdraft or by 20 percent for four seconds and then they're there put my teeth back in and generally speaking you will use madness for situations like skolex desorge or maybe in very very rare cases tyrannical instances i say very rare occasions because that's where you start getting into the territory and the strength of wilfred's sigil of superior summoning now this legendary is by all accounts busted for aoe especially when you do have your four set and you're running inferno and you are able to play around with stacked target counts because what this legendary does is every time you spend a soul shard you reduce the cooldown of summon infernal by 1.5 seconds now rain of fire is a three shard cost spell which is four and a half seconds worth of cooldown reduction on your summon infernal which means that in some good settings you can get enough of um rain of fires out that you can actually end up with a infernal that is roughly a minute cooldown rather than three generally though you will see your cooldown come down to a two minute cooldown which ends up lining up perfectly with soul letting ruby for instance and this is why when you move from madness to wilfred's you see that trinket shift from iqd to soul letting ruby because it lines up better fights like prototype pantheon really good example of this because you can start the fight with havoc and madness and pumping a lot of single target damage because on two targets you won't be rain of firing you'll be focusing on your havoc windows and chaos bolting but the moment you get into the final phase when you have all four pantheons up um the side and Athreus, war duty and renewal then inferno actually becomes really strong and you'll see that if you go through logs you see the people of the destruction warlocks are getting minute and a half cooldown infernals and literally getting in an extra cast that they shouldn't have been able to get in normally and that's kind of where wilfred has its strength so these are the three legendaries that you will run or two legendaries you will run and these will be your bread and butter for everything crafting recommendations madness would to go on head rather than hands primarily for the extra item level but also socket which is always nice and wilfred's you can craft anywhere in terms of wrist or finger a lot of people tend to craft it on finger because then you get better secondary stats but i personally have it on wrist because it's better optimized for my gear so we've discussed legendaries let's briefly touch on the stats and then we'll get into the rotations so the stats then now a lot of people and generally speaking stats are very personal depending on the gear you have the recommendation is for you to sim yourself and i appreciate that's not always the best so as a very very quick touch up as i did with previous videos on screen you're going to see the generalized stat ruling that you're going to need if you're running roaring blaze it's going to be item level haste into mastery haste and mastery can be quite close in terms of value but for here just the haste into mastery then into crit then into verse now the moment you get tier mastery's value drops off dramatically and the reason for this is because it is randomized you're wanting more haste and more crit which generates you more embers overall and that generation of more embers because you've got to remember that if immolate crit or incinerate crits you get double value on the ember 
fragments or the shard fragments that it gives you. So by having more haste to crit, you get more shards and more shards then results in more damage. Versatility is then just better than mastery because versatility is flat and there's no RNG element. So that is the general ruling when it comes to stats. Nothing huge and great with any particular breakpoints that you care about outside of remembering that once you hit 30%, you do then start hitting the diminishing returns window for stats, which means that in order to get more percent in that stat, you need a greater and greater amount. So when you hit 30% of a stat, it may be worth looking at putting your extra stat allocation into something like crit or verse and trying to get a good mix i'm kind of running 33 27 25 in terms of haste crit then mastery and my versatility is at about 11 percent at the moment i think off the top of my head feel free to you know have a nausea at the stats i run or at the stats other people run because it's that's actually a good way to learn as well because if you look at a certain fight that you're progressing on and you have a look at say the top 10 warlocks and see what they're running you will actually see the value rather than the percentage so you might have one warlock running 1180 haste and if they're running that much haste you can kind of see well okay that's a good ballpark figure for me to aim at which for reckoning is about 31 percent ish so a good thing to keep in mind and hopefully this helps now we get onto the rotational section and we will also cover havoc as well especially in relation to kyrian because that's quite big it's the rotation section then we're going to start with the preface that destruction doesn't have a traditional rotation as it were so you're not going to want to get all your keybinds in order and try and learn it by muscle memory it's very much a priority spec so on screen you can kind of see the general priority you want to apply or maintain your immolate cast chaos bolt to prevent ca any shard capping cast cataclysm on cooldown if it's talented so for an opener you're going to want to precast incinerate and then precast conflagrate so if you're stood at max range you should time it so that your cataclysm hits the same time your incinerate does and it automatically applies your immolate as well because that is one benefit of cataclysm then you want to always keep your conflagrate rolling on two uh so it's never at two charges if you can help it there will be points where you hit two charges like your mid chaos ball cast or something that can't be helped but ideally you always want to keep one conflag charge rolling cast chaos ball to two maintain eradications ideally you want to be casting a chaos bolt every two to four seconds because it still does need that travel time to get to the boss in order to maintain your eradication and then you're just casting conflagrates incinerates to generate your shards so you can go back into the priority order and for aoe this doesn't really change the only difference is rather than casting chaos bolts once you get to three, four targets, you're going to want to be casting your Reign of Fires. And you're going to want to maintain Immolate, hard casting it up to eight targets, as long as they're going to live for the majority of your Immolate duration. This goes back to what I was saying about if mobs die too quickly, it can really hamper our damage, especially in AoE, because we need to get many Immolates out in order to start generating a lot of shards paired with rain of fire and our other abilities in order to start spiraling so applying immolate to your target maintaining it and then making sure that you don't overcap shards and you keep your conflagrate charges rolling is pretty much a good way to go for a rotation now we're going to discuss the important bit and that is how to maximize havoc which will be its own video as well but we're just going to go into it briefly for this video so let's get on to that then right folks so in this portion or this particular video depending on whether you're seeing this as part of the updated destruction guide or as its own standalone video we're going to be discussing havoc and the nuance 
especially in relation to Kyrian and kind of how Havoc should be used. So let's get into the game and kind of talk through things as we go. I do apologize. This is going to be a little bit slow. I'm not great at talking and doing simultaneously, so there'll be a bit of back and chopping. So first things first, Havoc as a spell, you can macro it in a few ways. Now, it's recommended to macro it because then you don't need to worry about it. I personally use a mouse over version of the macro, so I can quickly apply Havoc to a target. So you can see that I've not got anything targeted. I just mouse over and I Havoc one of them. This is a lot easier and prevents me from needing to swap off a target. Another variation of this could be you have a uh, at focus Havoc macro, especially if it's like a cleave boss fight where you know there's going to be two targets up and you can pre-focus something ahead of time. But generally how I used to play multi-dotting as Affliction back in Legion, but I found that mouse overs are a little bit faster. Problem with mouse overs though that is worth mentioning is unless you know where your mouse is at all times, you can sometimes accidentally mouse over the wrong target, which in Mythic Plus isn't always going to be helpful. Now, Havoc in an AoE setting is quite easy to think about. What you want to do is you want to just throw it on a target in a pack that you're facing. So if we go over to this particular pack, you can throw Havoc up on that target, immolate, and then you want to obviously generate more, and you can be generating shards through the extra Havoc windows, because Conflag will help generate a lot of shards, especially if you've got two targets Conflag simultaneously, because Conflagurate does give us a lot of shards for a single cast, and it also helps reapply our immolate across the board. So that's fine. Now, the nuance with single target and what makes Kyrian so strong especially is when you can abuse your Havoc windows. So you can see that I don't have a pet equipped, and this is because I'm going to target the Phalanx, and we're going to treat the Phalanx as though it's a boss. And this is a particular instance where you're going to have um, the Sorge, for instance. And it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it does sometimes help. So you can see that the Phalanx has 4.46 million health. So we'll treat this as the boss. Now these cleave targets have 1.49 million health. And this is a key distinction. If these weren't training dummies, the, the whole point of this would be you'd be fighting the boss as normal, going through things, and an ad is about to spawn. Now, you don't need your mouse over macros for this, but it does help in other settings but what you can do is you can have a swap to your the new ad that spawned and then immediately apply scouring tide now you see scouring tides on both targets you then just follow through you're bursting but now this smaller ad is your kill target and with it being your kill target it should die and with the dot still on it as it dies you get the five shards and you get your languishing soul detritus crit buff and it's still ticking away so that by the time your first buff has expired your 45 percent crit and your 100 percent movement speed expires then the second one should expire hopefully giving you a period of 16 seconds where you go from 45 percent crit 100 percent movement speed to 15 percent crit and 33 percent movement speed and then allowing you to reapply scouring tithe for free because it's obviously had its duration refreshed now fights like the soldier are a good example where you might actually want to hold it until the next ad phase depending on how quickly it dies and how quickly it resets because you may want to ensure the cast gets off obviously that's an entire personal thing and down to how quickly you're progressing and killing things but that is generally how you're going to want to use Havoc Windows in order to maximize this. Because you're aiming for that 16 seconds of crit and movement speed on a regular basis. In a Mythic Plus setting, so if we come down to this end again, you're going to have a pack of mobs. And the point where Mouse Over Havoc comes in handy, 
is if we say skull is the lowest health target and we're going to be focusing star for instance so we'll assume that everything's up and rolling stars are a thing we then notice really quickly that skull is close to death and by close to death i mean say sub 30 percent health immediately havoc it and then it's into a scouring tithe and at that point scouring tithe will hopefully be one of the things that tick over so skull then dies and we then get that crit while in an aoe setting and the other benefit of it in a Mythic Plus setting is the fact that we do actually have Forge Light Mechanicos's Fuse Anima Accelerator, which further reduces the cooldown of Scouring Tithe from the 40 second cooldown it is to a 25 second cooldown. Sorry, not 20 second. But you get the point. So it can spiral and you get a lot of crit. Again, you're aiming for these 16 seconds of just free crit. Hopefully this particular portion has helped with the havoc. I appreciate I'm not exactly the fastest at demonstrating, but still, hopefully it's helped. And that concludes the 9.2 updated Destruction Warlock guide, because I think after the havoc, it's probably a good place to stop if you have any comments feedback what you like didn't like do please comment below and if you really like the video please do maybe hit the subscribe button it'd be greatly appreciated and thank you again for taking the time to watch this i will catch you in the next one take care